Good morning, everybody. <laughs> it's good to see everybody here. Thank you for coming and joining us. It's the day that the Holy Spirit came on down to the church. We're celebrating the season of Pentecost today, and we thank you for being here. This is a time when we get to be together, and we get to think about the difference that that Holy Spirit made and the difference that it can make in our world until this day, and we are called to be part of that difference. We do appreciate you being here today. If this is your first time with us, there should be a connect card in the pew rack in front of you, and we'd ask you to take that and fill it out and let us know that you have been here. If you have prayer concerns, put it on that same card, fold it over, drop it in the offering plate. We will respond to whatever you tell us there if you need us to. If you're joining us via live stream, welcome. We're glad that you are here as well. You can go to the address you'll see on the screen and do everything that I've just said, and we will respond to you as well. But we're glad you're with us, and we hope that you'll continue to come and join us. Today is the day that our Lord has made for us to be able to gather together and worship. And I could do the next part a little better if I'd keep up with my bulletin. Our litany of Pentecost is printed in your bulletin and on the screen. Join me in this. God, today we give thanks for the good gift of your Holy Spirit, our helper. Come, Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God present among us. As on the day of Pentecost, when your spirit rested on your followers as tongues of fire, as they were filled with the Spirit and began to speak and prophesy, just as Jesus promised, just as the Father has promised, empowering us to proclaim good news to the poor, to exchange beauty for ashes, a spirit of praise instead of despair. We are your church, your body here on earth, who trust in the resurrected Christ and in the Holy Spirit of God here with us now. Amen. Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your hope. We thank you for your power. We thank you for your presence with us. We thank you for the miracle of Pentecost that happened 2,000 years ago that empowered those people to burst out of their place of hiding and become a force of change in the world. We pray, oh God, that we will experience that same power and that same force of change as we gather in this place. Let your spirit be upon this hour of worship. Help us to know that you are with us, that you are among us, that you love us, and that you care about us. Help us, O oh Lord, to be your love to one another and to the people around us that we work with every day, that we live beside. Help us, O oh Lord, to experience you and to let you live through us in life. For it is in your name we offer our prayer. Amen. Let's stand and greet one another by passing the peace of God. We love the joy and excitement when you visit with people for today. Stay standing if you're able and sing along with us. Ready? I'm coming with the heart of worship. I'm bringing in a brand new song. 
I'm ready to see the unthinkable. I'm ready for a miracle. Hearts praying for a fresh encounter. Souls looking to the living God. I'm ready for a real revival. Oh, Holy Spirit, come like a flood, like a fire. Holy Spirit, fall in this place. Fill our hearts. Holy Spirit, come like a flood, like a fire. Holy Spirit, An overflowing of your kingdom. We're ready for a real revival. Oh, Holy Spirit, come like a flood, like a fire. Holy Spirit, fall in this place. Fill our hearts. Holy Spirit, come like a flood. Oh 
Precious God, we thank you so much for this beautiful day, for this the wonderful day of Pentecost where we can celebrate that you came to earth and that you came into our hearts and you came into our lives. God, so that we can be a light and an example to others for you. And so right now, as we come to this time of tithes and offerings, Lord, we just ask that, that you use these gifts to further your kingdom that good comes from the money that we give and from the gifts and time and talents that we give to you, Lord, um, that they truly are for you and not about us. God, quiet our hearts and our minds. Let us hear you. Let us learn from you and let us love others for you today and for the rest of this week. We love you, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen.
Thank you, Daniel. That was passable. <laughs> you did a good job. You really did. Oh, my goodness. It's the day of Pentecost. And so we are reading from the book of Acts, chapter 2. It reads like this. On the day of Pentecost, all of the believers were meeting together in one place. Suddenly, there was the sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm, and it filled the house where they were sitting. Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared, and it settled on each of them. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them the ability. At that time, there were devout Jews from every nation living in Jerusalem. When they heard the loud noise, everyone came running, and they were bewildered to hear their own languages being spoken by the believers. They were completely amazed. How can this be, they exclaimed. These people are all Galileans, and yet we hear them speaking in our own native languages. They stood there amazed and perplexed. What can this mean, they asked each other. But others in the crowd ridiculed them, saying, they're just drunk, that's all. Then Peter stepped forward with the 11 other apostles and shouted to the crowd, listen carefully, all of you fellow Jews and residents of Jerusalem, make no mistake about this. These people are not drunk, as some of you are assuming. Nine o'clock in the morning is much too early for that. No, what you see was predicted long ago by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit upon all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. On those days, I will pour out my spirit even on my servants, men and women alike, and they will prophesy. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That is an amazing passage of Scripture right there. It gives birth to the, one of my favorite times of year, which is this time of year. I can't speak for all of the pastors of the world, primarily because I don't know all the pastors of the world, but it actually does embarrass me when I think about how little the post-COVID church resembles the church of, that burst out of that room on Pentecost Sunday. When the church sociologist and the other experts are trying to describe the post-COVID church, they use some words that we don't ever want to hear used about church life itself. They use words like lethargic, sluggish, angry, and fearful. Now, I know none of those words could be used about our church. I don't think anybody could look at our church on a day-to-day -day basis and call it, as, call it lethargic and, and sluggish and angry and fearful. But if Pentecost and the church that came bursting out of that room is an example of the ideal church, then I'm not really sure any church can quite measure up to what we saw that day because the words that you would use to describe Pentecost are words like enthusiasm, commitment, excitement, courage, and joy. <clears throat> On the day of Pentecost, there were about 120 people sitting in that upper room of that house, and they were all frightened, and they were all confused. Jesus had told them to go back to Jerusalem and to wait for something to happen, but they didn't know what they were supposed to be waiting for, and so nothing had happened, even though they had been praying for it, ever, even though they had been waiting for it, so far nothing had happened. And then on top of that, the people who crucified Jesus were the people who were out on the street. They were celebrating the Feast of Pentecost. It was basically the world's fair of, of Judaism, and, and they saw those people who were in the upper room as the enemy. If they had known they were there, they would have probably been angry about it. The Jesus people were scared for good reason. And they were praying for Jesus' promise to come true, even if they didn't know for sure what that promise was supposed to be. But then suddenly it happened. All of a sudden, the power of the Holy Spirit came raining down. It came pouring down on that church. And when it did, those people came bursting out of that, that upper room with power and with excitement and especially with courage. 
They had just experienced a miracle that couldn't possibly have come from any place in the world except God Almighty. And they were so happy and excited and boisterous about it. Everybody on the street thought they were drunk. Man, I wish that would happen in our church today. I wish that would happen in every church today. I've been pastor of churches for 46 years and not once has anybody ever called the police because they thought those Baptists were all drunk on Main Street. On the other hand, I have had the opposite of that happen in churches before. Back in my younger days, I used to do a lot of consulting on church growth issues. And, and when I was in Charlotte as the associate pastor of a large church there, there was another church there in Charlotte that was sitting right in the middle of an area where they ought to have been growing like wildfire, but it just wasn't happening. And so they got in touch with me. They asked me if I would come and, and work with them a bit. So I went and I met with the staff and I inspected their facilities and I started trying to figure out exactly why is it that they they aren't growing. I wasn't finding a lot of things that would have kept the church from growing. But then I went to church on Sunday morning. I had two surprises that Sunday morning. Number one is there were more people there than I thought would be there. I, they had a lot that they could be growing with, but my second surprise was very different from the first one. The second surprise was that nobody was speaking to each other and, and everybody was coming in, looked, looked angry or they looked depressed. So I turned around to the pastor and I said, are your people always like this? And when I did, he looked at me with a puzzled look and he said, I'm sorry, what are you talking about? I said, your people are acting like if they smile, it's going to break their face. Is it always like this? And he said, I'm sorry, I still don't quite understand. And I said, your people look like they're going to a funeral and nobody wants to go to a funeral. If you want your church to grow, this has to change. You've got to bring some joy and some excitement and some togetherness and some family to this room. Pastor sat there and he turned around and he looked at me real hard. He said, hmm. And then in just a second when the music, the, the, the opening music started, which was terrible, Oh, it was terrible. It was just terrible. But when, he got, when the first song that they were playing ended, he walked up to the pulpit. He looked out at his congregation and he said, good morning. Join me in the call to worship. And I thought, man, I'm glad they're paying me for this. <laughs> What's the point of all that? The point is nobody in Jerusalem looked at that house on that first day of Pentecost and said, there's a funeral down the street. We need to avoid it. When Pentecost came, those people had so much joy and so much excitement. They heard so much boisterous joy coming from that house. The town thought those people just had to be drunk. And Peter didn't help anything when he said, people of Jerusalem, listen carefully. These people aren't drunk. It's only 9 o'clock in the morning. That didn't exactly take the edge off the drunk part. That would be kind of like somebody coming into our church on Sunday morning and saying, I think Tommy's drunk. And Chuck Lee looking at them and saying, Tommy's not drunk. This isn't his drunk time yet. <laughs> That's kind of what Peter said that day, whether he realized he was saying it or not. But... If we get hung up on that little part, we're going to miss the point of this story. And the point was, when the Holy Spirit came, it created a party. It created a party that was so powerful, the non-believing world came running because they wanted to be part of it. That's what God wants every church to be. That's what God wants every church to embody in this world. He wants it to be the fellowship of joy, the fellowship of excitement, the fellowship of love, the fellowship of inclusion, the fellowship of a celebration. I don't know about you, but it would absolutely thrill me if if, if, if somewhere along the way people started seeing that same kind of joy and love and energy in our church that they saw on that first day of Pentecost. Can't tell you how happy it would make me if somebody did call and report a bunch of drunk people at 550 North Main Street. I'd love for our church to be known as Party Central in Blacksburg, but as far as I can tell, that's not how the world sees any church, particularly in America right now. 
I've told you this before, but about a decade ago, the Barnard Research Organization asked a group of college students to name the first words that came to mind when they heard the word church. The first word that those students named, said was boring. The second word was judgmental. The third word, word was exclusive. The fourth word was hateful. The fifth word was crazy. The sixth word was hypocrite. They were nine words into that survey before any of those students ever said anything positive. Why am I telling this again? I'm telling it because that same survey was done again in 2022, and the only difference in that survey in 2022 was they were 13 words into the survey before anybody ever said anything positive. And the worst part of all this is that survey wasn't done at Yale or, or Harvard or Berkeley or, or some of the other places that we associate with secularism. It was done in Texas and Mississippi and Indiana and Iowa. Folks, I don't know about you, but when I think of a hotbed of liberalism, Texas and Mississippi ain't it. If you can't get a group of college students in the South to say something positive about the church, what do you think it's going to be like in the rest of the country? What do you think it's going to be like in those places like Yale and Harvard and Berkeley and Princeton? How did the church manage to let that happen? How did we manage to surrender the concepts of celebration and inclusion and joy to the secular world? And more importantly, what are we going to do to try to fix that? Well, I could be wrong, but I think the first thing that we have to remember if we want to fix it is that Pentecost was an inside job. The party started in the souls of the believers. It started in the lives of those people who were gathered inside that upper room. The, the Spirit of God came to the believers, to, to the people who were there because they trusted Jesus even if they didn't know, he didn't, didn't know what he was trying to do. When the Holy Spirit came that day, it came to the people who were on the inside the people on the outside thought it was all about alcohol. They thought nobody could be that happy unless they were drunk, but they were wrong. Peter stepped forward and he shouted to the crowd, and Peter's words pierced their hearts, and they said to him and to the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? And Peter replied, Each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Step one was faith. Step two was the party. The church people didn't know what they were waiting for, but they had faith that Jesus was going to keep his promise, and he did. And when the Holy Spirit came to that faithful church, those people exploded out of that house because they couldn't wait to bring the party of God to the world around them. And this party that they were wanting to bring could not be done with alcohol. It had to be done by the power of the Holy Spirit through faith. And it was both an individual transformation that came to those people, and it was a community event, a community transformation, which means the Christian faith is both personal and it's social. It starts within us as individuals, and it comes from our faith in Jesus Christ and wanting Him to be part of our lives and then it goes to the entire family and it draws us together as one and we become an empowered people who are going out in numbers to try to make a difference in our world it is both personal and social it takes unity a unity of faith and a unity of spirit one of the best books that Max Locato ever wrote was a book called it's not about me I wish everybody in America would read that book because there's an, there's an epidemic going on in our country right now. It's an epidemic of it's all about me. And that epidemic is creating chaos and stress and dysfunction and division in our country and in our churches. 
I've been a Christian since I was 16, and I've been a pastor since I was 21 years old. I have never seen a marriage come apart, a family come unhinged, a church fall into conflict, or a nation become divided without at least one person deciding it's all about me. And I'm telling you, there's nothing more destructive than selfish thinking. There's nothing more destructive than selfish attitudes. Jesus Christ was nailed to a cross because selfish thinking people, the Pharisees, decided it was all about them. It didn't matter if an innocent man was about to die. They had to protect their place. They had to protect their position. They had to protect their religion. They had to protect their ideas. And so if Jesus wouldn't shut up, if he wouldn't stop talking about grace and love and the party of God, then Jesus had to die. Why? Because that's what always happens when it starts to become all about me. Selfishness always tries to destroy whatever shows up to challenge it. But unfortunately for selfishness, the Holy Spirit is a challenging spirit. In fact, the first thing the Spirit did on the day of Pentecost was it challenged the fear and the worry and the emptiness and the confusion that was alive in that upper room that day and that was alive out on the street in the people. And it's been doing that ever since that very first day. I know I've said this before, but one of my heroes of the faith is a young German girl by the name of Sophie Scholl. Sophie died when she was 21 years old, and and she died because she was a Christian college student who who had the, the courage to challenge Adolf Hitler and the Nazi party and its movement during World War II. Most of Hitler's opponents used violence to try to overcome the Nazis, but Sophie and her brother Hans were both Christian students, and and they, they were dedicated to their faith, and so they refused to use violence. They founded an organization called the White Rose that that was dedicated to nonviolent resistance. And they published an underground newspaper that that argued against the Nazis. They they turned their words into a weapon. and, And they were so successful at doing it that the Nazis unleashed all of their fury trying to stop what they were doing. Folks, if you don't believe that words matter, then think about two things. Number one, Jesus had one son and he made him a preacher. Words matter. Number two, look at how violent people become when they're trying to stop the things that they don't like to hear. When they're trying to stop the things that they don't want to to be challenged with. When they're trying to stop the ideas that are different from their own. Think about how violent people can become when they're trying to stop words. The White Rose made their words known until February 18th, 1943, when the Nazis finally tracked down Sophie and Hans and they threw them in prison. Four days later, they executed them for their words. Those two people had never harmed anyone, but they were executed because their words were a challenge. On the day that Sophie died, there was a prison guard who was mocking Sophie, and and she asked her if she was afraid, and Sophie said, yes, I'm afraid, but fear is always selfish. True love is never selfish. And the guard said, hmm, and what do you love, my dear? And she said, I love God more than anything else, and I, I know God would never do to the Jews and to us what you're doing So I would rather die living for God than to live in fear. But this I promise you, you may kill me, but you will not win. 
Later that day, Sophie was asked if she had any last words before she died without missing a beat. She said, how can we expect righteousness to prevail when there is hardly anyone willing to give themselves to a righteous cause? Such a fine sunny day and I have to go now. But what does my death matter if through us thousands are awakened and stirred to action? That is the party of God. That's what the Holy Spirit came to give birth to that day. When the Spirit came to that upper room, those first Christians were hiding and they were living in fear, in selfish fear. But the Holy Spirit challenged that fear and it changed it into joy and celebration and courage and hope. And when it did, those people came bursting out of that house with power because they were ready to challenge the selfishness of the world with the Word of God. And what's interesting is most of those people who came bursting out of that upper room that day, they ended up dying for their faith. They proclaimed God's love and God's party for the next 50 years, but most of them died for doing it. But what we need to remember is they never quit doing it. They had a joy and a purpose that they were willing to live for and that they were willing to die for. And we're here this morning in this church because they never quit. They believed the party of God was worth the prize. Acts 2, 17 through 21. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit upon all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. In those days, I will pour out my spirit on my servants, men and women alike, and they will prophesy and everyone who calls in the name of the Lord will be saved. Peter wanted the world to experience that prophecy. He, he wanted it to, be, they wanted the world to become God's dream. He wanted it to become a community of joy and unity and challenge and change. And the reason Peter wanted that to happen is because Peter knew the gospel of Jesus Christ is supposed to make all things new. There will be neither male nor female, slave nor free, Jew nor Greek. The young will see visions, the old will dream dreams. Men and women will proclaim the joy of God and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Back almost 50 years ago now when I was chaplain of the county jail in my hometown, we baptized one of the meanest men that I had ever met in my life. He was as angry and, and mean when he came to that jail as anyone I'd ever seen. But a few months later, he started listening to God's Word as it was coming to the Bible studies and to the worship services. And, and within about a year's time, his life had completely changed and he wanted to give his life to Jesus. He wanted to be baptized into the faith. We didn't have any kind of a tub to put him in, so we baptized him with a garden hose. He may not have been dunked, but he got wet. A few months after he got out of jail, I ran into his daughter at a ball game one night and I asked her how things were going. And when I did, she said, I don't know what you all did to him when he was down at that jail, but he went from being a mean and absent father to being one of the best daddies that anybody could ever want. Daddy said it was God, but whatever it was, our house became a very happy place. And I never thought I would live to see that happen. Friends, there's a lot of things that need to change in the world. There are things that need to change in our lives. There are things that are going to be changing right here in this church in the next few weeks. And a lot of people are distressed about that. I've been distressed about that. The reason I'm standing in this pulpit today, it's going to be the last time that I get to stand in this place. And I remember like it was yesterday, the first time that I preached in this pulpit. I stood up here in front of a crowd of people. And one of the things that I noticed when I walked into the pulpit was that there was a telephone in the pulpit. <laughs> I had never seen a telephone in a pulpit before. I wasn't sure what this thing was supposed to do and I remember pulling it up and looking at it and I looked out the crowd and I said, I bet Billy Graham doesn't have a button telephone in his pulpit. 
there are a lot of things going to change. And seeing, seeing this pulpit go away is one of those things that I'm having a hard time with. All of you are having a hard time with some little element of things. But, folks, what I want to remind you of and what I want us to say and what I want us to claim and what I want us to hold on to is that change is the hallmark of the faith. Change is the hallmark of what we believe. If things and people aren't changing, the church has lost its purpose, it's lost its power, it's lost its spirit. So what I want us to do is I want us to claim God's spirit today. Let's pray for God to make this our season of Pentecost. Let's claim the future that God is giving us. Let's claim the faith that he has offered. Let's claim a challenging faith that can go into the world that is with all of the confidence in the world that we can help turn it into something more and something better. Let's claim this season as our season of Pentecost and let's believe in the party of God, the party that he wants to give us. And then let's make a pledge to go into the world around us and bring the world a party that they've never seen before. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, I pray today that you will be with us in this time, that you will pour your Holy Spirit out upon our lives, that you will bring to us the gifts that we need to experience. There's some of us that needs to start with that personal moment with Jesus. We may be religious, we may attend church, but have we ever asked Jesus to come into our lives and to recreate us from the inside out, to pour his spirit inside us so that we can become empowered people? Help us, O oh Lord, to be willing to come to you and to say, Lord Jesus, I know that I need you in my life. Give me the, the courage and the strength. Give me the faith to come to you and say, Lord, come into my life and make me into the person that you want me to be. Challenge me to become more than I've ever been before. Take away my spirit of selfishness and, and fill me with the, with the spirit of, 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 of hope and unity. Fill me with the spirit that's willing to go into the world and become your challenge of grace. Help me to become a person who loves you and who loves your world help me to become what you would want me to be fill my heart with purpose lord and help me to be a pentecostal follower because you have a party for all of us and you want to do nothing more than bring us that party make it so lord jesus for it's in your name we pray amen Let's stand and sing together.
Thank you for coming and joining us here for worship today. Thank you for being part of this fellowship of faith. This has been a, a wonderful day for us to be able to gather together and celebrate what it means to be the people of faith. Next Sunday morning, we'll be meeting in the fellowship hall downstairs. And so come, be ready to make adjustments, be ready to make changes, be ready for the changes that are about to occur. And let's come with a spirit of unity and a spirit of hope and a spirit of excitement as we march toward what God has in front of us not just what he has behind us that we can be thankful for, but what he has in front of us that's still to come. Now may the Lord bless and keep you and make his face, hold up. I just got through saying something. What am I supposed to be saying about that? Ah, okay. Did you hear what Janet just said? <laughs> I didn't know I was supposed to do that, but pick up all that stuff and let's move it out of the sanctuary and we get ready to go. Wait a minute. Now may the Lord bless and keep you and make his face to shine upon you and give you peace this day and every day, now and forevermore. Amen. Now let's go. <laughs>